So welcome to another Epigram episode. Today we're interviewing Michael Marshall. He has his company in DC, Michael Marshall Design, for a couple of years now. So yes, but before that, I've been an architect since 1989 here that's, in Washington, DC. That's a long time, Michael. It's a very long time. <laughs> so tell us more about how you started here in DC or your, your yeah. student life or career life. Sure. Inform us. People well, from DC. <laughs> it's, it's been interesting for me as an architect. I grew up in, um, in a family that was not very highly educated. So um, my grandparents had been sharecroppers, if you understand what that means, <clears throat> in the South in Virginia. And uh, my parents moved to DC uh, in their early 20s. And um, so growing up here in Washington um, was, was, I think, a much better opportunity for me than if we had stayed in the South in Virginia. So um, at the age of 11 uh, is when I first saw a set of architectural plans. But before that, as in kindergarten, first grade, and on up, I liked to draw a lot. That was my sort of fun thing to do. Um, and so because of that, a friend showed me the drawings and I said, what are those? And he said, oh, these are um, the drawings that my dad, who his dad was a carpenter, needed to build the project, to build the house he was working on. And he forgot them, so my friend had to take them to deliver to his dad. And he said, the architect draws these. And I said, architect, what's that? He said, that's the person who does the drawing so that my dad can build the house. Right. So, oh, I like to draw, maybe I'll be an architect. So that was at 11. Wow. And then <laughs> I stayed, I took drafting courses in junior high and high school, art classes. Um, and then I started my academic career at University of the District of Columbia here in DC. And from there, I transferred out to the Catholic University for my bachelor's degree. And then from there- Here I, in DC as well? Yeah, also in Washington, which was a great program. The great thing about UDC was that they gave us incredible technical education so that after my first year of school, I was able to get a job in an architectural office and actually contribute because I knew how to detail uh, the buildings and, and um, and do the actual drawings. Now, remember, this is all before computers. I know. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so so um, everything literally was drawn by hand. But but that that was that was fine because for us it was also a way to understand how buildings are built because you literally had to draw the two by four. You you know, it, it was all very manual, uh, hands on. So uh, from there, going to uh, the Catholic University was great because um, not only did we have instructors who were versed in art and history and theory, but they also had a foreign studies program. And <clears throat> I had never really traveled before, so it was great in 1979, this summer, I spent in Rome and in London. Oh. And that was fantastic. It opened my eyes to um, <clears throat> the history of architecture, but also contemporary architecture at that time. And so from there, I um, enrolled at Yale University. And that, again, was another incredible stepping stone because there were people teaching there that I read about <laughs> in all of undergrad. I had James Sterling as a professor. Wow, that's I had amazing. Frank Gehry as a professor. Uh, Aldo Rossi was teaching there. Um, Michael Graves, people like that at that time who were very prominent and important architects. So um, it was great to, to be in New Haven. It was close to New York. Uh, so I also got to be introduced to New York through friends and spending time there. And uh, so it was the 80s, it was the heydays of um, postmodernism. Yes. And uh, so it was, it was a great education for me. That's, that's incredible. Like yeah. I know Michael from before, I used to work with him before, and from everyone that I know in the city, your drawings, your sketch are the most amazing that I have seen so far. So maybe we can then, or you can, we can share sure. some links and show them, but 
it's amazing. So if you know how to draw since 11 years old like that, <laughs> Like that's that's incredible. Well, thank you. Well, actually, an interesting thing has just happened is that the Smithsonian has started to collect my archives of drawings and models. Wow. So that's very important to me. So they have um, drawings that I did at the, at nine years old or wow, part of their collection. Wow, Michael, that's that's and it's very exciting. Sorry, I didn't tell you that earlier. No, I, I think I, I knew, but I didn't know bit. it was already like yeah, nine already years good. old. Oh yeah. my God, my mom is still keeping all my sketches for one yes. day. I will tell her today, hey mom, That's right. keep them all, <laughs> look at my Put them away, yeah. <laughs> put them away. Someday it'll be good to show, show that's, your progress. That's amazing. So um, projects that you worked on, there are different things that, um, that our firm has done. Uh, that they're collecting the models that Michael Van built wow. for Man Elementary are in that collection. Wow! Um, so it's, it's it's great. Do you know when these will be? I don't know when they will actually corner? have, we don't have know yet. A, yeah have an exhibition. But what they're doing is is collecting it all so that the different curators can pull from it when when they want. This is for the African American history and cultural part yeah. of, yes. the, of the of the of the Smithsonian. So they'll just, it'll be there for uh, research. It'll be there for um, different uh, ways of viewing it. Wow. So, um, and there will be more. I will give them more over time. So well, I'm sure you're so like, we're to continuing, keep producing. we're still going. Yeah. And you know, you still need the Olympics and. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when we get to the Olympics. Um, <clears throat> but basically, um, after uh, going to Yale, I moved back to DC. And, um, and that was very uh, good fortune for me because um, I worked for a firm called Hartman Cox here in DC mm -hmm. and an interior design firm. And then I got a grant from the Graham Foundation. <clears throat> and um, that allowed me to go back to Europe again. Ah, so, I didn't know you went <clears throat> back to Europe. Yes. Is that and when you went to Italy to Yes, I studied. Um, <laughs> yes. I, um, went back to Italy mainly to study the architecture that Mussolini built okay. in, the, in the 30s. And this was all in relationship to paintings that um, de Chirico had done. And so to understand the translation between those 2D images that he built, uh, to compare them to what Mussolini's regime had built, uh, the sort of classicism that was still kind of modern in a sense, without a lot of the detail that you might find in a Renaissance square or Baroque square, but Mussolini did these things, um, had his architects do it. So I wanted to just do that to understand how to have inspiration from 2D art and to things that we build and can use and inhabit. And so uh, I did that and traveled all around Europe at that time, which was great. Wow, how I, old were you there? Oh, I was maybe uh, 29, 30 years ah, old at that point. Perfect age. Uh, yeah, awesome. it was great. <laughs> you <laughs> yes. absorb everything. <laughs> yes, <laughs> your age, I was your age. <laughs> and um, so from there though, I, got, I traveled through most of Italy at that time, but also Spain, France, Germany, Switzerland, um, and, and then also to, to, London, to England and uh, Always, it's a great. Always, for architects, is a great excuse to travel. Ah, don't say that. <laughs> see, don't say that. Everything's, <laughs> everything's new, and it's great to be able to see those things. So, I, I had that fellowship. I came back and started my own practice at that point. So that was my next question. So you start your practice right after that? Yes, right after that wow. when I came back, uh, because before I left, I had been doing freelance work while working at the other firms. So I had kind of a little bit of a client base. And, um, and most of it at that time was private residential work. So as a young architect, uh, additions, renovations. But then um, at one point I had a professor, uh, Anita Reiner from Catholic University who taught modern art history. And she introduced me to some friends, Vivian and Elliot Pollock, friends of hers, to build a new house from the ground up. Oh. So that was a great opportunity. That was your first project. First project. Well, first project like that at that scale. Like, I've been okay. doing additions. But from ground. From ground up, wow. yes. And, uh, and it was great. It was a pretty substantial house at that point. Uh, 
10,000 square feet, uh, an open brand new site. Wow. And uh, so I designed the house almost like a village in a sense. The rooms had their sort of individual shapes off of a 75 foot long gallery. And the reason why I could have the gallery in the house is because they were art collectors. So um, when I was at Catholic, I had a minor in art. And Anita, as I said, was one of the history teachers. So um, I'd been able to work on projects that have related to people who own art and how to live with your art, um, whether it's painting or glass work uh, or sculptures. And so that was a great opportunity to, to do that project. That's an amazing good client to have. Yeah, you know? and as a first, the space, as a first yeah, house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and so from there, though, meeting that client, um, I've also met people who were developers. And so I was able to parlay going from the private residential work to the commercial and development work here in DC by seeking out a site that was owned by DC government. So at 23rd and L, um, 23rd and maybe it's 22nd, there was a police station and a library that needed to mm -hmm. be renovated in the West End. That project has become a real project and another developer did it, but at that time I did drawings and models for the development of that site and with a friend who is an attorney and um, a developer, we approached the DC government to make an unsolicited proposal for the site. So the interesting thing is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the person we met with um, really found it fascinating, but then said, you know, at some point the city will put that out for RFP, sure. so it's open to everyone. But this particular guy who was um, chief of staff to the economic development head at that time, remember the work that I had done and when the project that came up um, for the old convention center site, when the new convention center was built, was gonna be redeveloped. And so it was a solicitation for, um, for different developers to vie for that project. And there was policy for that mayor, Mayor Anthony Williams, mm -hmm. to have small businesses DC-based businesses, people who live in DC, be part of those projects. So from that end, from that, yeah, we're still he remembered. <clears throat> yep, exactly. And they introduced me to one of the development teams, which was for a city development. And to be honest, I did not know anything about them. <laughs> I went for the interview, and at and so they said there would be a national design firm involved. They couldn't tell me at the time, but they thought it would be a good fit and they gave me their um, annual report. So I didn't know anything about Forest City and they're a major developer. Yeah. And I said, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a part of this team. And so we found out it was Robert Stern's firm, who at that time was the dean at Yale. So that's why they thought it would be a good fit. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. But then, um, you know, it's sort of funny how these things work. A week later, I got a call from Heinz Development. So a friend in Texas had told them about my firm. And, um, but I had already committed to, to them. Yeah. To them. <clears throat> and so we got to the end and it was uh, a short list. It was for a city against Heinz. And um, so it was really interesting because around this time of year, back then, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which year it was, the city asked, the developer for a city to maybe switch lead firms, lead design firms, because they wanted a firm that did more modern architecture. Uh, and that was that came from the Office of Planning at that time, the people who were ahead of it. And so Bob Stern graciously stepped aside. He was doing other work for Forest City. And um, so I got a call from the developer. I was on vacation. <laughs> and she said, I have good news and bad news. She said, the bad news, they've asked Bob, asked us to change architects and Bob's agreed. The good news is that we have to find someone else, but we have to find very quickly. And so um, we knew Heinz had uh, Norman Foster's firm. And so, I, and so she's asking me this, here I am a young architect, who do you want to work with? Oh my God. On this project, <laughs> that's basically is a billion dollar 
development. And I said, well, Renzo Piano. We want to work with Renzo oh my Piano. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they have Foster. Let's get Piano. And um, Piano had just also started working with them on the New York Times building mm -hmm. with, with Forest City Ratner in New yeah. York. And I just thought, okay, it would just be a natural flow. So this is a great story. They, um, they called Piano's firm to see if they would be interested. And we had to do the work in August. They said no. Oh. They said no <laughs> because they just shut down their offices in August. What? Yeah, that exactly. <laughs> they, shut, <laughs> they shut down their offices in August, and so they weren't interested in the project. So then I thought, okay, we came up with our next was um, Richard Rogers' firm, and they had been doing work in New York, and the guys had just flown back to London, and they literally the next day got back on the plane, came back, and we did charrettes here for the project. Wow. <laughs> So wow. those, those are the sort of things that talk about an eye opener, you know, that a firm could be at that state that they can just say, nope, you know, that's Europe for you. Yeah, <laughs> but it's still, it's, it's yeah. amazing that, you know, like you just like came out from school, start your own stuff, your own film with no hesitation at all, just straightforward with that. Then, well, you know, yeah. time Work grows, here. developers, and then you can, you can pick which whoever you want to <laughs> work and yes. like, okay, bring me Renzo. <laughs> no, that's. Yeah, now, just, hopefully one day we are at some point like, bring me Michael Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, but uh, yeah, Renzo, that's a whole other thing. He is my, their firm, the work that they do as a team, is my, some of my favorite. Their work, Norman Foster's firm, uh, and, and Richard Rogers' firm, so. Uh, but, but from there, okay, we did not win, Foster's firm won, um, but I got to be involved then because of the exposure to uh, the project that now is called City Vista. Mm -hmm. And we were teamed with a local firm here, uh, Torty Gallus, as the designers for that. So then from that point on, I was known for being involved with these projects um, that are special to the city, in particular public-private partnerships. So um, it's interesting because people ask me, well, what's your specialty? As an architect, I say my specialty, the special projects for the city. That's what we've been able to do. That's what and I said, with passion. With passion, <laughs> exactly, with passion and with great variety. So since that time, we've been involved with um, the Howard Theater renovation, um, which is a historic theater for uh, African-American performers um, from 19... 10, I think it was built, so it's actually older than the Apollo Theater. So during segregated times, there were um, issues with mixing of African Americans and white Americans in public facilities. So the Howard Theater was built for the performers who were African American and for the audience. And um, over time, uh, it was built originally sort of in a Baroque style on the mm -hmm. interior, lots of tracery work. And then during Art Deco time, and then even during the 40s and 50s, a lot of that detail was stripped out. And by the time we had the riots here after Martin Luther King's death in 1968, the theater had gone into disrepair. Wow. And so the city became ownership of the theater at some point. And I'm not sure how that happened. Either maybe taxes weren't paid or something like that. So coming back, you said you work in City Vista and different projects in the in the city, which are different typologies. You said yes. with Howard Theater as well that you were telling us the story. So yes. how was and how is now the Howard Theater? Or yeah, I, I would say um, right now there there has been in the past 20 years now a foundation that's built for creative output here in the city yes. that is world class that we've moved up a notch. Um, we're not seen as a sleepy little southern city anymore. We have all you millennials that have moved here from all over the world. That's true. And so we now have different opportunities that we didn't have before for creativity in the city. We also have a government that supports creativity, starting with our mayor and all the different uh, arts groups that are here, the theater, the Kennedy Center, things like that. So I think that 
this next generation, your generation uh, coming here, will be able to pick up the ball and move even further with um, making uh, artistic statements that have um, international uh, meaning. I think, you know, we have, we're Washington, D.C. Obviously, there's lots going on here with politics. Yep. But we're building a strong artistic foundation here in the city. So I think young designers now can express themselves beyond being conservative or, or just trying to stay within a certain box. Yeah. Everything from the art installations, the type of things that you guys have been doing, uh, even some things that might have some uh, political edge or meaning to it. Uh, we are quite an international city. Um, you know, when we look at the different things now, you know, the concerns about immigration, too late. I'm very happy that, <laughs> <laughs> that we have, as my firm and as you have known, have people from all over the world, yes. uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, DC is a great place for people from all over. So um, I think we're getting people from different uh, artistic backgrounds and educational backgrounds, and that diversity uh, only makes us special here in Washington. So it's, um, I think, it's just a great place to be. We have, at one point, a thousand people a month moving into DC. Yeah. So our diversity uh, is what's going to make us stronger, um, and uh, and will allow us to be competitive, also. So. I I think it's as you said, for instance, when I moved here 10 years ago, eight years ago, I didn't know how long I was going to be here and then time keep passing and then I feel so much involved with the city, with all yes. these creative movements yes. that are happening. And it's hard for me to think, okay, I will move somewhere else, but because I feel like, damn, this is, it has the right temperature, this city right now yeah. for creativity or for people who's starting and it's, it feels that we can reach something else or we can yes. start drawing the boundaries differently, yes. in, as you say, like outside the box or... Yeah. Well, with technology, I mean, you know, this piece, what we're doing here now, it's going to be seen all over the world. It's so yes. easy to do that. <laughs> and um, that's the, the, the beauty. We have, this is a great city to live in. Um, we have the monuments, the memorials, the museums, the galleries. Um, and just um, beautiful neighborhoods here yeah. in DC. So um, we weather the recession pretty well uh, here, true. our economy, um, and we're building great neighborhoods. Uh, some where that have been vacant over the years now is, you know, places like well, this even place. here where we are, like yeah. in Ivy City, that it's changing a lot and yeah. it will keep changing. This Hopefully was all, when, when I was a kid growing up here, sort of industrial and nobody cared about it. Yeah. And now you look at, you know, again, another arts hub and another uh, community, residential community that um, didn't exist before. So uh, I think there are also some great opportunities here and we keep getting people uh, coming. Like I said, a thousand a month is incredible. And from all over the world. And from That's all over the world. Insanely rich in terms yeah. of culture. Yeah. Yes. So being, you know, like a young entrepreneur, super successful <laughs> back in the day and super successful now, what would you, do you have any Recommend. piece of advice or recommendation for the youngest generation yes. to follow? <laughs> yes. Um, use all the different modes of media that you can to express yourself and to get your vision out there. Um, work hard but also play hard too. Yes. That's, the thing. <laughs> That's the thing I, I like didn't that. do as much. But the play, the play hard is networking also. So you might meet somebody who does a certain thing and then they'll say, oh, you do this, then maybe we should get together. And then you have a new expression, a new yes. uh, mode of, of being artistic. And um, that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, again, you guys have you know, just an amazing thing, not to make a pitch for Google, but just if you think of something and you say, oh, I can't remember such and such a word, Google it. Yes, you have it all on <laughs> and, your computer, uh, it's true. You know, having grown up without Google, um, I, I'm not sure totally if, if millennials appreciate it, but those guys deserve every penny they get, Bill Gates, all those guys, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what they've done uh, just changed our lives. And, uh, and uh, someone at my age, there's clear appreciation of that. 
the ease of being creative now um, with these little devices that we have yeah. now. You can almost make an Oscar winning film with a, with a cell phone. Yeah. And you, you just know. find inspiration everywhere now. Yeah. It's, it's really technology easy to get. is in your pocket. So uh, enjoy it. Enjoy <laughs> it. But also remember that there are going to be generations after you. So mm -hmm. appreciate them I know. <laughs> the way we appreciate you guys and help and pass it on. And yeah. have uh, times like this where you talk about how you started and to where you are now and how they can um, contribute and move forward. So I appreciate what you're doing here. And this is a, quite a privilege to, to be part and to be a rung in the ladder uh, here <laughs> I in think DC. It's a, our great pleasure for us to have you here, Michael, and being able to share your story with everyone. So for the audience, thank you very much for being, the, for being there and keep tuned for the next episode next Monday. And Michael, thank you very thank much. You. You're amazing. My honor. <laughs> my honor as well. And remember, keep your drawings. The very first <laughs> drawing you do on a napkin, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because you never know, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations on that as well again. It's thank you. Impressive. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> we should hug, really. <laughs> <laughs>